certainly want to thank you all for this opportunity to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to participate in this meeting. So in this talk, we're going to talk about uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And I've been given this title, Repair, Replace, uh, or Do Nothing. And essentially, uh, when I look at this field and think about TMVR, uh, there, there are several key points I want you to keep in mind. So first, uh, MR really is, I consider, a public health crisis. Uh, I think the option of doing nothing uh, is really just inappropriate for this large number uh, of patients. Secondly, when we're talking about repair versus replacement, right now it's largely a discussion about how much residual MR you're willing to accept versus the risk of that prosthesis eventually degenerating. And I think that's how we actually are talking to our patients because we do have the full gamut in our center. Uh, and so this discussion comes up quite a bit. And then finally, the final key point is that I think there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in MR. And there's a lot of uncertainty because th the disease process is so heterogeneous uh, in, compare in comparison to other valve of the heart disease. And that needs to be uh, addressed and studied further. So when we look at patients with uh, mitral regurgitation, we know that these patients are really common. And uh, I think many of you are familiar with these data uh, from Vu Nukoma that were published a number of years ago. Uh, and 6% of patients over the age of 65 have significant MR. And, and that's important because every single day, uh, there are 10,000 people who turn the age of 65. And so there are currently millions, and there will be many more millions uh, as our population continues to grow. And if you look at the survival of these patients, it's really much poorer than I think we really tend to talk about. Uh, whether it's primary MR or secondary MR, uh, the survival is generally around 40 to 50 percent, uh, even if uh, at five years. And even if, even if that's the case, even if you look at the patients who are asymptomatic. So in other words, if you have a patient with MR and it's severe, their survival is actually worse than most cancers. Uh, breast cancer is more survivable than MR in the current climate. So when we look at patients with MR, uh, and you look at the fact that there are 4 million people out there, they have a survival that's like cancer or worse. Right now we do about 40,000 surgeries, and if you combine all these things, you really are with, uh, you're with a large unmet clinical need. And it's, it's really just unfortunate, but that's the current climate. And that's why there's an incredible interest uh, among many different companies to help address this, particularly from a transcatheter standpoint. And so when we look at uh, the repair technologies out there, the prototypical repair technology is MitralClip. And I think you all are familiar with this. Thus far, almost 50,000 patient, patients have been treated with this technology worldwide. And in the U.S., it's been available since 2013. So uh, I just want to share with you the most recent data uh, on MitralClip, and these were presented at the ACC this past uh, spring. 3,000 patients who have been treated with MitralClip in the United States, uh, median age 82 years. The STS predicted risk of mortality was 9.2%, and that's important because the in-hospital mortality that was observed uh, with MitralClip was actually only 2.7, uh, so quite low. And when you look at the MR reduction here at baseline versus uh, post-clip, uh, it was quite uh, significant. So 93% of patients had a reduction in MR to grade two or less, and then grade one or less was achieved in 61%. So it's not surgical-like in terms of uh, the MR reduction rates, uh, but it is uh, quite significant, especially when you think about the fact that these patients have minimal or, or no surgical options. And it's also important to look at that because when you look at what's being treated out there, it's, it's almost a little bit crazy. So this is a, a patient who uh, we treated uh, last year. Uh, she had had a partial aneoplasty done eight years ago. Her posterior leaflet was resected. And if you look here, uh, if you're a mitral clip user, uh, this pointer's not working, but if you look in the lower uh, left-hand side, uh, there's essentially no posterior leaflet to grab. So this patient uh, was in her late 80s, didn't want surgery, and so I, we offered her a mitral clip, and if you can see in the top right-hand side, what we've done is we've actually clipped the anterior leaflet to her surgical aneoplasty ring. And here on the lower right-hand side, you can see that with that, her MR is getting a lot better. And the reason why uh, patients like her uh, are being treated is because this is the current vantage point for mitral clip. Uh, it's like a view not too far from here, from the west coast. Mitral clip sits in a blue ocean. Uh, 
I mean, there, there are no competitors in, uh, realistically. It is the dominant uh, player in the market, and it's being used in more and more different patients in a different variety of pathology. If you look at the current TVT practice, 30 to 40 percent of patients would not even come close to meeting the Everest criteria in terms of enrollment in clinical trials. So it's, it's clearly uh, the dominant player uh, because it sits in that blue ocean. But it won't stay blue forever. And we know that there are many different repair technologies that are being developed, way too many to describe and keep up with. So how about replacement? Uh, and replacement I think you all are familiar with as well. Uh, many different technologies, again, too many to count. Uh, and this is an example, you all are familiar with this. This is the Intrepid, uh, and this is one of our cases. And it's incredibly gratifying because you, know, you, you put in these valves, it takes 30 to 45 minutes. The procedure time for an Intrepid or other TMVR technologies, it's less than the cross clamp time for a surgical uh, valve uh, procedure. Uh, which is typically around 60 minutes. And after our first case, um, our surgeon looked at me and said, I just can't imagine why I would want to do or replace a valve any other way. It's just so much easier and so much faster. And when you look at what's being done out there, the, the indications that are being treated are expanding. And so <clears throat> this is another example, and uh, Gorov talked about this earlier. Uh, these MAC patients are very high risk. Uh, you can look at this patient here in the top left-hand corner almost circumferential, severe calcification. These patients are at risk of AV groove disruption and dying on the table in a traditional surgery. We went to the FDA and got uh, compassionate use approval uh, to do Tendine. And if you look there, uh, this is a nice uh, short axis view um, uh, of the Tendine, a long axis view. And uh, this is the, yeah, so if you can see here, with that valve in place here, no leak, and, uh, and the patient's done incredible seven months later. And we actually did our second one uh, just last week, it's almost exact same pathology and same outcome. So it clearly is uh, an emerging uh, technology in this space. And when you look at the most recent paper on the Tendine TMVR uh, Global Feasibility Study, uh, remember these are 30 patients uh, who are high or prohibitive surgical risk. The STS was 7.3, but it doesn't really speak to how high of a risk these patients are because uh, I think we all know that ischemic MR or secondary MR patients, the STS is significantly limited in, in terms of predicting the, the outcomes. But in this, uh, in this cohort, first 30 patients, not a single procedure death. And uh, the valve is implanted in 27 of them and there, there's no MR in 26 of the 27. So it's quite remarkable uh, what's being done. And I think uh, in terms of uh, TMVR, there are essentially just two main limitations. First is the technical limitation, which you've already heard about uh, to some degree. It's the LVOT and the risk of obstruction, which I think we're uh, getting uh, very good at predicting, particularly with pre-procedural CT. And then the second uh, issue is going to be really the durability, uh, because as I mentioned, these valves are very easy to put in. And uh, my surgeons uh, have already stated they just don't want to put the valves in any, in any other way. And so it's really going to be about the durability uh, of these processes. So when we're thinking about transcatheter repair versus replacement, it's a very complex question. And so, uh, so when we're looking down the line, we can look at the surgical guidelines. Uh, and the surgical guidelines really tend to be based more on the pathology. So if you look at primary versus secondary MR, it's mostly repair for the primary MR patients. And for the secondary MR, it can be repair or replacement. And to give you an idea of what uh, is currently being done, so this is a CTSN trial. And this is the uh, trial that randomized patients uh, with severe ischemic MR to having repair or replacement. There was no difference in the two-year mortality, but the cohorts were really small. Uh, but the important finding of this paper was that there's a 59% recurrence rate in MR uh, at two years for patients who had surgical repair. And so uh, this is a very important finding, and I tell you, again, it's given my surgeons a lot of pause, and they've said that, well, for severe ischemic MR, they just want to replace everybody because they don't want to deal with uh, residual recurrent MR. And I understand where they're coming from because when you look at some of the surgical literature uh, on unaddressed MR, uh, this is a paper from Mayo, uh, that looked at recurrent MR in patients, and this is mostly degenerative MR, uh, but what you can see is that there's a real hazard uh, and a worse survival uh, for the patients who had recurrent uh, MR versus those who didn't. 
And that's in patients who are surgical candidates. So if you look at patients who are not surgical candidates, like uh, the TVT registry for mitral clip, this is very interesting too. And these are data that we just found this year, is that there actually is a penalty for grade two versus grade one MR. And so it's important that, you know, again, we try to get our patients treated as optimally as possible. And in the TBT register, I'm sure the operators are doing their very best, but we have to think about, well, how much residual MR are we gonna be willing to accept? Uh, because all of the transcatheter therapy technologies don't achieve surgical-like results. All of them get about 60 to 70% in terms of grade one or less, but there's almost always about a 30 to 40% uh, rate of moderate MR or worse. And that's simply just not acceptable when you look at populations if we ever want to expand outside the prohibitive risk population. So when we think about who will we treat with transcatheter therapy, there's a residual MR question in terms of what you will be willing to allow your patient to have and how you will select those patients to optimize those therapies. And you'll think about primary, you'll think about secondary MR, we have to think about, well, are we going to repair or replace a dilated LV or non-dilated LV? Uh, right now, uh, the TMVR studies are almost done exclusively in patients with dilated LVs because you need a certain size of the heart to accommodate the prosthesis. We also have to think about the surgical risk. Uh, right now, a surgical risk is a criterion for TAVR. Is that really appropriate for mitral? Uh, I actually don't think so. I think it's, it's more about uh, the durability rather than the surgical risk. And then we also have to think about mitral referring centers or not. Do, should these always be done in mitral centers? Not sure. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I think the TMER procedure is easily teachable. Uh, there are some aspects that need to be uh, um, taught or paid attention to particularly, like the apex management. But the way these valves go in, particularly for a transfemoral approach, it's the equalizer. If you think about our surgeons and what they do in terms of complex repair, that certainly requires a referent center. But if we're just going to replace the valve like we do for TAVR, I'm not so sure. And then you also have to think about, well, if they were a surgical repair or replacement candidate, does that alter how you would look at them for transcatheter therapy? And that's also another complex question because as physicians, we also have trouble thinking about that as well. So here, these are data from the STS registry looking at 40,000 patients. And this is a nice analysis because this has patients grouped according to the STS score and categorizing them by repair or replacement. And you can see here in the far left-hand side that patients who are at lower surgical risk tended to get repaired and patients who are at higher risk tended to get replaced. But despite that, even patients who are 12 plus in terms of the STS prom, almost one in five were still getting repaired. And I think, again, that, that speaks to a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how to approach these patients. And these things we're going to have to sort out when we're going through the trials and deciding how to interpret how we're going to apply our, our transcatheter technology. And then finally, when you look at all of this, we have to go back to the pathophysiology. You know, when we talk about aortic stenosis, it's really easy. Uh, AS causes pressure hypertrophy. We go in and do a TAVR, and it's really curative. But when we talk about MR, MR causes volume hypertrophy, and it's not as clear if we interrupt that one part of the arm that that's going to stop that progressive uh, uh, predisposition towards uh, worsening heart failure. And whether or not it's, it's curative, I think it remains to be seen. And that also generates problems for uh, our endpoints and clinical trial design. So to give you another uh, example of how that can affect the outcomes, uh, these are the STS ACC TVT registry data on mitral clip according to FMR versus primary MR. So here, this is uh, FMR versus DMR for death. And you can see here at one year, there's already a seven or 8% uh, point penalty if you have FMR versus DMR. And then here, at one year, 49% of patients after CLIP ended up in the hospital or dying. And so in other words, you have a 50-50 chance of making it one year without being in the hospital or dying after CLIP for FMR. And I think uh, it's, it's quite provocative to think about, well, how are we really going to be affecting uh, these patients' uh, prognosis? We know that in terms of the endpoints, uh, if you look at a cross here, whether it's MR reduction, LV volume uh, reduction, heart failure symptoms, 
medical catheter, mitral valve surgery, mitral valve replacement, all of those have been shown to affect those endpoints. That, that's very, very clear. But in terms of survival, only medical therapy has been shown to be beneficial. And so when we're thinking about uh, designing our trials, it's gonna be very complex in terms of thinking about our endpoints. So in summary, some unique aspects for transcatheter mitral valve repair. Uh, in terms of measuring the efficacy and safety, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the standard of care. Uh, a lot of heterogeneity in the population. There's varying expertise and, and access to it. We know uh, about the problems with certain centers doing more cases than others. And then finally, there's the uncertainty about the impact of what we do uh, in terms of the pathology. So uh, it's very exciting, but I think it's going to require a lot more study uh, to determine uh, where that transcatheter therapy role will be. So in closing, uh, MR, uh, again, I would say it's a public health crisis. I think we have to think about valvular disease, in particular MR, uh, in that way. And until we start thinking about that, we're never going to generate the awareness like what we have for breast cancer and other malignancies. I think right now it is a really discussion about uh, residual MR versus the prosthesis. Um, a lot of our TMVR patients are in their early 70s, and, uh, and we have a discussion about, well, if you do make it to 85 or 90, you may need to have that valve replaced. And that's hard, uh, and that's hard uh, to talk about. And then finally, uh, again, lots of heterogeneity means lots of uncertainty, and that requires further study. So again, thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's certainly been a pleasure being here. Thank you.